Okay, I'm, I'm very pleased to call on Professor Thomas Schneider. Um, he's in the department, is Thomas here? There he is, okay, sorry. He's from the Department of Egyptology and Ancient Near Eastern Studies from the University of British Columbia in Canada. So please, he's gonna introduce our speaker. Well, thank you so much, Tom, and um, dear Dean um, Elman, thank you so much for your words. It is my pleasure and a distinct privilege to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Professor Manfred Bijak. The University of California, San Diego, and the conference organizers are honored to welcome a keynote speaker who has championed the study of Egyptian archaeology and Egypt's interconnections with the Levant throughout his entire career in such a pioneering way as I could just give an example of what he served and what functions he served as professor of Egyptology at the University of Vienna and director of the Institute of Egyptology, as director of the Austrian Archaeological Institute in Cairo and its founder, as chairman of the Vienna Institute of Archaeological Science, as chairman of the Committee for Egypt and the Levant at the Austrian Academy of Sciences, and as director of the International Research Cluster Synchronization of Civilizations in the Eastern Mediterranean in the second millennium BC. Manfred Bitak's impact on scholarship in Egyptian archaeology and neighboring disciplines such as the archaeology of Israel and Palestine has earned him membership in a large number of distinguished scholarly academy academies and institutions, to mention only the Archaeological Institute of America, the Austrian Academy of Sciences, the British Academy, the German Archaeological Institute, the Institut d'Egypte, the Royal Swedish Academy of Letters, the Académie des Inscriptions en Belles Lettres, the Society of Antiquaries London, and the Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, Manfred was also a visiting professor at the College de France, at Harvard, and a guest professor at the Hebrew University, just as a token of his reputation. Manfred Bitak's landmark excavation at Tel Adaba, and I'm sure we will hear um, um, a bit about Tel Adaba in a mo few moments, Manfred Bitak's landmark excavation Tel Adava in the Eastern Nile Delta, the capital of the Hyksos, has revolutionized the field of Egyptian archaeology and Egypt's interconnections with the Levant. I think it can likely be regarded as the most significant excavation project carried out in Egypt within the last 50 years. By virtue of Manfred's unrelenting inquisitive inquisitiveness, his scholarly acumen, and his ability to publish the fieldwork without delay in publications of the most rigorous standards, he has laid lasting foundations to a new chapter of our historical knowledge. Manfred Bitak has steadily expanded this knowledge by his own prolific scholarship. I just mentioned that he published more than 20 self-authored or edited monographs and close to 200 articles but also by creating platforms for the dissemination of scholarship. Um, we just heard about the importance to reach out to the community, to mention only the journal Egypt and the Levant. So it is a delight for me to have you here, Manfred, and we are looking forward to your keynote lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, dear Thomas. Uh, I would like to thank the, the organizing committee, particularly Tom Levy and uh, the dean for inviting me. It's a big honor to address such a distinguished uh, audience. I uh, would like to say that I'm not a Bible, Bible scholar. I'm not a specialist in Old Testament studies. Uh, um, the reason why I may be invited to speak here is perhaps that I made specialized studies on the geography of the Eastern Nile Delta and uh, that I directed for uh, several decades uh, the excavations at uh, Tel Adava, the capital of the Hyksos uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, center of uh, settlement of Canaanites uh, in Egypt. I would prefer if it is darker here, if possible, and uh, yeah, good. We proceed. Uh, 
I don't need headlight. <laughs> Number one, we have to consider a community of uh, Near Eastern population in the Eastern Nile Delta. Of course, the Nile Delta always had been the recipient of uh, immigrations uh, from uh, uh, the, the Near East uh, since prehistoric times, uh, uh, but uh, a special uh, development went on from the late Middle Kingdom onwards. Uh, Middle Bronze Age, uh, carriers of the Middle Bronze Age culture settled uh, in the Delta, particularly east of the easternmost Nile branch. Uh, we see uh, quite a lot of settlements. In the meantime, we have to add also Heliopolis. Uh, the, most of those uh, settlements uh, spread during the Hyksos period between 1640 and uh, 1530 BC. Uh, the, but uh, the settlement started more or less already in the late 12th dynasty, which means around 1850, 1840 BC. Uh, this is a community which developed there and which stayed there for several hundred years. Uh, this may be now a surprise to you, because, uh, uh, but from the late uh, Middle Kingdom to the Hyksos period, uh, and even beyond, as uh, new research showed, these people were not driven out of Egypt, uh, as uh, we learned from uh, Josephus Flavius, but uh, they stayed on, as we can prove now, at least a fair part. Just uh, to bring you in the center of our research, uh, Teletaba and Gantia uh, had been uh, the capital of the Hyksos, Awaris and Piramese, the uh, delta residents of the Ramesides in the 19th dynasty. The situation of this site is, uh, um, from a strategical point of view, most important. Uh, it's situated, on the one hand, at the Pelusic branch of the Nile, which was uh, the main uh, navigation artery into the uh, Mediterranean. On the other hand, it's uh, the end of the so-called Way of Horus, uh, uh, the highway uh, to the Near East uh, along the northern Sinai. Um, and uh, this site was protected by an enormous swamp system, a drain natural drainage system. It was the biggest drainage system in the Delta. Uh, the bah today, it's called the Bahr el Bagar. But before uh, uh, Wilcox, Sir Wilcox, uh, revolutionized the Egyptian uh, irrigation system, uh, this place were swamps and an enormous overflow lake uh, protecting practically this site uh, from, uh, the de from the desert. So this means that uh, already this geography, this geographic uh, uh, background, uh, uh, has something to do with the subject of what I'm going to say about the Exodus. This is the site of Teletaba. Um, it's uh, an enormous site, 250 hectares. It is uh, 2.5 uh, times as large as the biggest Syrian uh, royal towns at the same time. I mean, Gatna is 100 hectares. This site has uh, 250 hectares, which is about uh, one square mile. It was perhaps the biggest town in the Eastern Mediterranean in its time, and only later superseded by the royal uh, residences in Thebes and in uh, Amarna and in, uh, uh, in Piramese. Uh, what I wanted to show before is it was a harbor town. It owed its uh, importance uh, uh, to a harbor situation uh, we found by geophysical survey an enormous harbor basin, 400, 450 to 400 meters, with a uh, channel connecting it to the Nile system and an exit channel. So it was uh, the uh, harbor function of this site which was so important. And I would like to add that this site was not only uh, the site of Awaris, capital of the Hyksos, it was already important before, and it was important afterwards. 
after the Hyksos uh, uh, capital, Avaris, had been taken by the 18th dynasty by Ahmose, the founder of the 18th dynasty. Uh, the Egyptians started to use it as an offensive military base. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Avaris was abandoned largely, but uh, the 18th dynasty uh, inhabited this part and, of course, the harbor. Uh, and uh, we find uh, royal palaces in this region. It was uh, Peru Nefer, the major naval base of the 18th dynasty. Uh, and uh, this is a second uh, uh, very important site in Egyptian history. And finally, of course, um, this site developed uh, into a Pyramese, uh, the delta residence of uh, the 19th dynasty and the famous Ramses town, which also played an important part in the, uh, in the uh, sojourn in Egypt and in the Exodus. Well, this population of uh, Near Easterners, which started to settle there in the late 12th dynasty and enlarged their community considerably, uh, introduced, of course, Canaanite cults in this place. And, and we found, uh, for instance, this uh, seal cylinder uh, of uh, hematite uh, showing uh, the northern Syrian storm god Baal Zephon um, stepping from one mountain to the other, the Hazi and Nani uh, brandishing a, uh, a duckbill eggs at the club, and he is shown above, uh, therefore, as a victor uh, above the sea. Uh, personified by the snake Yam, but a god, therefore on a pedestal. He is shown as a patron of the sailors. Uh, behind him is the weather bull. Uh, but the seal was cut according uh, to Edith Porada, one of the foremost uh, uh, experts of, uh, uh, of seal art, uh, as a, uh, cut in Egypt. Uh, a copy, uh, so to say, of uh, um, Syrian seals, but uh, made in Egypt, which is very important because this means uh, this cult and this image was produced in Egypt already uh, by um, the newcomers. But we also have original seal impressions showing the northern Syrian storm god Baal Zephon. So this, his cult obviously was well established in this town. Not at the very beginning, we have only, uh, but during the time of the 13th dynasty. Around 1700, or shortly before, this huge temple was, it's about 30 meters to uh, nearly 22 meters, uh, was constructed. It's a, not an Egyptian temple, it's a Near Eastern temple, a broad room temple uh, with a huge niche. It has uh, many features uh, uh, which it shares with Near Eastern temples. But what is important in front of it you have a forecourt with an altar, uh, with an uh, with a inflammation altar, the first uh, of this kind ever found in Egypt. There's a second Near Eastern type of temple, a bent axis temple with the Holy of the Holies uh, on the left uh, uh, end uh, of the temple with a tower. And uh, uh, everything was surrounded by cemeteries and Egyptian type of chapels. Uh, so there was a kind of blend uh, in religion, but uh, the major temples were uh, constructed uh, uh, in the fashion of Near Eastern temples. Uh, uh, here is the altar. Uh, it was covered, and all around we found uh, calcinated bones. Uh, uh, but on the altar we found acorns, charred acorns, and as around the altar we found uh, tree pits, uh, we uh, think that uh, oak trees had been uh, uh, planted there, uh, which played a part in the cult. And the oak tree, as you know, is the tree of uh, the goddess Asherah. Uh, it's a synonym with Asherah. And uh, uh, it, it could be that this temple was uh, dedicated to Asherah. Unfortunately, no epigraphic evidence could be obtained, but uh, the temple was painted on the outside in blue, uh, obviously for a sky goddess, and Asherah was a sky goddess, but what is very important, Asherah was, uh, uh, had the epithet Asherah of the sea. So well fitting for a, uh, for a uh, town which uh, owes its importance uh, to its harbor. Well, this is a three-dimensional 
reconstruction of this uh, uh, sacred precinct with the oak tree and the, and the uh, altar. And uh, uh, here was, by the way, uh, a house which uh, was dedicated to banqueting, uh, perhaps a kind of uh, Marziach. Anyway, in front of the temple were, among other, uh, offering pits, uh, pits with um, two donkeys always, uh, which uh, are remains of uh, sacrifices, donkey sac sacrifices, reminding us uh, of, uh, um, uh, of uh, the correspondence of uh, Mari, where sacrificing donkeys is synonymous uh, with uh, uh, making a pact or making a contract. Well, but we also had uh, other kinds of uh, uh, monumental architecture. He, here, part of a, of a palace, uh, which is not an Egyptian palace, but an Eastern palace, which shares a specific uh, affinities, uh, features with uh, palaces in Syria. Here, for instance, the palace coup in Mari of, from the same time, or everything Middle Bronze Age. Uh, both palaces share in its south uh, this uh, courtyard with double uh, walls uh, which were filled in between and with uh, uh, a tower, a staircase tower jutting out of, uh, on the eastern, on the western side uh, and uh, even a very detailed uh, affinities uh, can be shown here. Here is a kind of pillar or a small platform, the same is true here. Um, so uh, in Teletaba, this was an offering courtyard with numerous uh, offering pits, uh, uh, which I cannot uh, show you here because uh, our subject is a different one. I just wanted to show here was a big community. About 30,000 uh, people lived in Avaris in its heydays, according to our estimates. And, uh, and there were many more sites. So we can uh, estimate that at least 80,000 um, people, foreigners, Near Eastern population, let us call them for convenience sake, Canaanites lived in Egypt uh, in the Eastern Delta at that time, uh, from the late Middle Kingdom till the beginning of the New Kingdom. Well, another feature is, for instance, the entrance of this palace. Uh, this is a facade uh, to the north, uh, northeast, uh, with uh, door towers uh, jutting out from the facade, but uh, there were two gates uh, in between a plaza. This is uh, the palace of Mari with door towers jutting out and uh, two gates and in between a plaza leading to a courtyard, leading to a courtyard. So these are very distinctive architectural features which show from where architectural tradition of the inhabitants of Awaris, at least from the elite came from. Well, we have uh, very uh, numerous burials, most of them even in domestic areas, so which is also a Near Eastern feature. Here, warriors with uh, uh, belts uh, and uh, uh, battle axes and uh, scimitars, attendant burials outside and donkeys outside. Uh, so this is a typical warrior burial from around the time when this huge temple was constructed. But what is interesting, this temple precinct did not stop with uh, the conquest of Avaris uh, around uh, 1530 BC under Ahmose, but we have evidence that it continued to be respected at least. Uh, well, uh, connections between the Hyksos and uh, the Israelites uh, uh, we know from F Flavius Josephus uh, that uh, uh, the Hyksos were identified by him as uh, uh, being uh, the proto-Israelites. Uh, I don't think so at all, but uh, um, just um, this is an important part in the, in the uh, history of uh, scholarship uh, dealing uh, with uh, the Israelites in Egypt and with the Hyksos. Uh, even names like uh, Jacob Heer, uh, the Hyksos Jacob Heer, um, uh, are biblical, but uh, of course uh, names uh, could be used uh, for a thousand years or even much more. We have biblical names already in Ebla in the third millennium BC. Well, Awaris was conquered 
And in every textbook of Egyptology, you may read the Hyksos were driven out of Egypt and uh, went to Palestine. Well, this is in keeping with uh, Flavius Josephus' uh, account of uh, the lepers who uh, stayed in Awaris and were driven out uh, by the Egyptians and went to Jerusalem. Uh, we can say now that this was not at all the case. Uh, the place was uh, abandoned, it's correct, but some parts uh, seem not to have been abandoned and there is a continuous <coughs> settlement, particularly in the western part of Avaris. Uh, besides that, the 18th dynasty started to construct uh, makeshift uh, arrangements for storage. Wherever we dug in the western part of Avaris, we encountered numerous silos from the time of Ahmose and Amenhotep the, the first. Uh, end of the uh, 16th century BC, even we found remains of a palace. It seems that uh, the 18th dynasty constructed here uh, a kind of stronghold uh, for the army for uh, uh, preparing uh, campaigns in the Near East. And we also found uh, remains of Kerma people fr from the Sudan. Uh, at that time, uh, the kingdom of Kush uh, in the Sudan was conquered by Ahmose uh, and Amenhotep I and Tutmosis I. Uh, and uh, of course, enormous quantities of uh, prisoners of war were shipped to the north, were stationed here in the north. We even found Kerma pottery, but also among the burials, our anthropologists were able to find uh, uh, people, uh, Nubians. Anyway, uh, this is not the part uh, where I think the remainders of the Hyksos uh, uh, period uh, st continued to live. They were more in the south, and we also found squatter settlements on the tail. But uh, what was a proof for us that uh, the population was not driven out of Egypt, the major part may have been dis distributed all over the, the country, but it would be foolish uh, to get rid of the carriers of the Hyksos rule, because many of them were highly qualified, for instance, in training horses, in uh, building ships, in uh, crafts, uh, uh, the whole military uh, industry uh, rested uh, probably on the technology of uh, the north, of the uh, carriers of the Hyksos rule. But what we found out was that the whole ceramic industry continued unbroken into the 18th dynasty till the time of Tutmosis uh, III, uh, you have uh, especially the wine amphorae, the dipper chocolates, uh, uh, sieves, uh, uh, the scarab industry, all th those workshops continued unbroken. Uh, this is uh, an, uh, a kind of wine sieve as we also found it in the 18th dynasty. This one is a Middle Bronze Age one from the Eretz Israel Museum. But also customs like uh, Ritual meals were all the uh, bones and the pottery used were interred, uh, uh, continued from the Hyksos period in the 18th dynasty. All this means that uh, a fair part of the population stayed behind, and this explains why cults of uh, Canaanite gods continued in the 18th dynasty. We have evidence that in Peronefa, the naval uh, port, uh, the major naval base of Egypt, uh, which we can prove now was in Tel Etaba, uh, uh, and not in Memphis. Why can we prove it? Uh, it has nothing to do with the Exodus, but just a short information. Egyptian uh, ports, which uh, uh, would uh, be suitable for Mediterranean navigation, uh, uh, have to be in the reach of the sea because uh, in the first part of the year when the Nile uh, shrinks to one-fifth of its normal uh, capacity, uh, it is the sea waters which penetrate the nearly empty Nile channels and which enable ships to sail and come back. Uh, secondly, uh, this Pelusiac branch is very suitable because it uh, has a direction to the north-northeast, 
and uh, you can sail half winds with the prevailing north northwest south south easterly winds and you can return under sails and you have not to row uh, what is very agreeable if you and very fortunate if you uh, sustain a harbor memphis is out memphis never could have been a peronefa but still now the major part of egyptology believes it just uh, because in Memphis were secondary cults, uh, affiliation cults for the gods of uh, uh, Peru Nefer. And there were uh, many of them, besides Amun of Peru Nefer, uh, were Canaanite gods like Baal, Baal Kuchu, um, Anat. All those gods uh, had affiliation cults in Memphis. But uh, uh, um, together with these gods, which are mentioned in Papyrus Salier 4, is also Soptu, who was the god of the Eastern Delta. So the whole uh, uh, geographic or the cult topography of the Eastern Delta was uh, represented in Memphis, uh, because Memphis was more or less uh, the capital of Lower Egypt. It was uh, the capital of the first Upper Egyptian gnome in uh, former history. Anyway, now in the, with the 18th dynasty, with this harbor and starts a new uh, era with royal palaces of huge size. This uh, <coughs> palace uh, precinct had 13 acres of 5.5 hectare, an enormous palace, only uh, explicable as a royal palace. And it was, uh, we can date it to the time of Tutmosis II and Amenhotep. Uh, the second, Amenhotep the second, who, by the way, was uh, a, <clears throat> a supporter, not only supporter, he, under him, uh, Canaanite cults flourished in Egypt, uh, and Jim Hofmeyer found a fantastic stela uh, of Amenhotep the second, showing that uh, Canaanite cults in the Delta flourished. He found it at Tel El Borg, a stela showing Recep and uh, Astarte. Well, afterwards the site was abandoned, so, but we can imagine that from the Hyksos period uh, uh, till the 18th dynasty, a fair part uh, of uh, uh, Western Asiatic population stayed at the site uh, till uh, the time uh, of, um, till the Ramesside period, as we shall see shortly. Uh, the site was abandoned at least uh, for, as a harbor for, uh, during the reign of uh, Tutmosis IV and uh, the first part of uh, the reign of Amenhotep III, uh, perhaps uh, till the Amarna period when Horemheb reinstalled the site. Uh, texts have a lacuna in this uh, period and uh, also the archaeology accompanies or uh, supports the text. We have no evidence that the site was used as a harbor or as uh, a site of importance uh, during uh, Tutmosis the fourth and Amenhotep the third. It started only after the Amana period, more or less, and it was Horemheb uh, here, uh, his famous statue in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, who. Uh, reinstalled this, uh, uh, this is uh, the natural landscape reconstructed by drilling uh, my, by my colleague Josef Dorner, uh, even with uh, isohypsis. Uh, here was, is, are the major uh, Nile branches uh, which formed uh, the topography of uh, Avaris. And this is an old water branch uh, which was only sluggish but protected the site from the east. And Horemheb started to construct an enormous fortress encompassing the harbor basin, but he also renewed the temple of Set, who was nobody else than uh, the uh, northern Syrian storm god Baal Zephon. He re rebuilt this temple, who was either neglected or destroyed during the Amarna period. Unfortunately, little has uh, been preserved uh, of those antiquities due to uh, extensive agricultural plowing. So this is the fortress wall of Horemheb with buttresses cutting into the remains of the Tutmosite uh, uh, palaces. Uh, 
but we found uh, tiles uh, which showed us the splendor of a residence within the uh, within uh, Horemheb's uh, fortress. And what is most interesting is, uh, which and what, what shows that uh, the population of the Hyksos period uh, continued to, to live there and have its influence in Avaris till the time of Horemheb until the 19th dynasty, are uh, the scarabs. Uh, suddenly scarabs appear uh, from the time of Horemheb, which have typical uh, iconographic features of scarabs of the Hyksos period. For instance, this uh, sun disk with uh, these funny uh, wings uh, um, and the tripartite uh, composition of the scarab, typical uh, composition of a Hyksos scarab, uh, which suddenly gots, uh, gets uh, uh, or got a, a kind of uh, um, became fashionable again uh, in this period. So, um, <clears throat> Well, this is the temple of uh, Suteches Fais. We uh, were able to assess it, the enclosure wall, 500 meters from here to here. And here you can faintly see the pylons. Uh, this is what we excavated uh, thus far. Uh, the major part was, however, destroyed by agriculture. Anyway, this uh, lintel uh, with the names of Horem Hep, but uh, it's a palimpsest um, uh, below. Uh, seem to have been the names of Tutankhamun. Uh, but Horem had probably as uh, uh, supreme commander of Egypt uh, uh, who started the wars against the, Hyksos, uh, the, the Hittites again. He reinstalled this temple, constructed uh, uh, even uh, within the temple we found uh, vineyards in pergola system, it even a kind of, uh, of wine press. Uh, uh, this is the enclosure wall uh, of this temple. And it was also Seti I who continued uh, rebuilding this temple of uh, um, Seit of Avaris, the Egyptian storm god. But in reality, it was not the Egyptian storm god. This is only the Interpretatio Egyptiaca. It was the northern Syrian um, weather god, Baal Zephon, who was uh, uh, celebrated here. Uh, and I, th I see here a cult uh, a continuity from uh, the late uh, Middle Kingdom till uh, the 18th dynasty, uh, not the, the 19th dynasty. Well, we know why Horem had uh, reinstalled this uh, naval base at that time during the Amana period. It was, was where the, the Hittites who expanded uh, their influence into northern Syria and became a formidable adversary of the Egyptians. Well, again, here, Awaris, uh, uh, Perunefa in the time of Horemheb, but uh, Horemheb also started to make installations in Kantia as Edgar Push, our colleague uh, originally from the Pelizios Museum, Hildesheim during his exploration, was able to find out, uh, fa to, to find out. And soon afterwards, it was Seti the first, and not Ramses the second, who started to build a palace in this region. Uh, in the numerous tiles were uh, found by uh, illicit digging and went into museums. Uh, there is a whole doorway in the Louvre. Yes, and uh, uh, here was also the, uh, Josef Dorna, my colleague, was able to assess the position of the temple of <coughs> Amun Reharachti Atum, the major temple of uh, uh, Piramese of the Ramses town, and Dorna also found by drilling those canals, uh, uh, cutting through the town of uh, uh, Piramese, which uh, became a town of 600 square meter, uh, 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 hectare, 600 hectare, uh, a very sizable. Uh, residence city. And uh, most important for our question is uh, uh, the co not, not only the continuity of the Canaanite population or Near Eastern population in Avaris, but also uh, um, here we have uh, uh, the stela of 400 years, which was uh, put up in front of the temple of Seth of Avaris, uh, showing uh, uh, Ramses II in a celebration in front of 
the gold seat, but he doesn't look like the Egyptian gold seat. Uh, he has a high uh, crown, he has horns, a high crown with a pomon. Uh, he has crossed bands and uh, a kilt, uh, typically the northern Syrian kilt uh, with tassels uh, in the end. This is not the Egyptian god said. This is the storm god uh, of Baal who was uh, worshipped in Avaris uh, as the seat of Avaris. But uh, behind uh, uh, Ramses II, there is a re representation of his father, Seti I, but not clad as a king, but uh, as a vizier. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, several scholars think that uh, the celebration of uh, 400 years uh, of the rule of king of Abba and Lower Egypt, Sutech uh, Apechti Nupti, he has uh, the Egyptian titles of this god, uh, uh, happened uh, not uh, during Ramses II, but uh, during Horemheb, when Seti I and his father Paramese had been viziers. This is a cult continuation, a cult uh, anniversary, obviously uh, celebrated in the time of Horemheb. And if we go backwards from around 1314 uh, uh, thir till 1300, uh, 400 years backwards we come to 1714 to 1700. BC, it's precisely the time when this temple was constructed, the Canaanite temple of 30 meters um, to uh, 22 meters, uh, and the whole precinct was constructed at that time. I wonder if uh, this is not by coincidence uh, uh, a kind of uh, cult continuity in, Pyramese, in Awaris and Pyramese carried through by uh, Western Asiatic uh, populations, Semites, Western Semites, living in Teletaba uh, throughout all this time. And I wonder if these 400 years uh, of continuation did not uh, filter into the tradi Exodus tradition of the stay of the Israelites in Egypt uh, 430 years. Uh, also here on this stela, it's not precisely 400 years, it's 400 years and, uh, 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 and uh, 40 uh, 400 years and uh, a year, a month number four uh, of, of this year and uh, the day four. So it's not precisely 400 years. Anyway, uh, it could be that the experience of this uh, long uh, presence of a Western Asiatic population in Egypt uh, f did not filter into the tradition of the uh, Exodus uh, or Genesis, the stay of 430 years of the Israelites in Egypt. Uh, this is absolutely possible, if not feasible. Uh, here we have this temple precinct uh, and uh, uh, I personally don't believe that the Hyksos have anything to do with the Proto-Israelites. Uh, chronology does not permit us to make this conclusion, but traditions uh, of the presence uh, of uh, Western of Canaanites in Egypt for such a long extended period uh, who entertained all those uh, Canaanite cults in Egypt, uh, particularly at the site of ancient Avaris, could have contributed uh, to this tradition. Now, uh, my opinion is that uh, Israel doesn't start before um, the beginning of the Iron Age. Uh, the Iron Age, uh, the spread of the Iron Age culture in the hill countries uh, and in uh, Galilee and in the Negev started approximately uh, early in the 12th century BC. Uh, perhaps uh, there are some houses uh, which uh, are attributed to the so-called Forum House already at Tel Batash uh, at the end of the 13th uh, century BC. But uh, be this as it may be, 
approximately at this time, uh, there is a spread of very distinctive settlements which uh, are identified uh, by uh, particularly Israeli archaeologists. We have among us Israel Finkelstein, uh, who is uh, among the foremost who uh, presented this kind of settlement. Uh, and it is in the, uh, mainly in the 14th, in the, in the 12th century BC. Uh, we have uh, especially typical uh, should be the so-called forum house, besides other features uh, uh, specified uh, by uh, archaeologists uh, in Israel. Uh, it's no coincidence, uh, perhaps, that exactly in the same period, in the 12th century, we have evidence in Egypt of a forum house. It starts in Egypt. Uh, it pops up in Egypt in a single uh, specimen. If uh, one would be allowed to excavate here more, one may find more forum houses. Anyway, within the precinct of uh, Aya and Horemheb, uh, just north of Medinet Habu in western Thebes, such a house has been found by the University of Chicago uh, between the two wars. Uh, the University of Chicago excavators were not aware what they have found, but uh, without doubt, this is a forum house. Not constructed of stone, but uh, in wattle and daub uh, construction with uh, uh, trenches and uh, post holes, and uh, uh, perhaps even this was the more original uh, way of constructing uh, these forum houses. But um, the plan is very typical uh, around uh, a elongated uh, middle room or courtyard, uh, several uh, rooms uh, all uh, arranged around it. Uh, the only difference is that the entrance in this case is, comes from the north, uh, not from the south as normal. But uh, the other, the orientation, even the long room in the back, uh, all of this is typical for the forum house. And uh, very typical is that you have on one side or on both sides, uh, but very often only on one side, a series of uh, post uh, holes. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a very specific plan which appears again and again. Here's a second one, unfortunately unexcavated. The excavators from Chicago, without any pretext, without the knowledge that this is a forum house, dated it into the 12th or 11th century. Uh, this forum house, uh, uh, according to the Chicago excavators, was constructed for, uh, for workmen who had the task to pull down the temple of Aya and Horemheb in order to construct a temple of Ramses IV, just north of this precinct. And so they took building material from an older temple. Uh, very typical for this uh, uh, kind for in this part of the, of the Egyptian history, which is uh, a very difficult part of the history with turmoils, with uh, uh, a lot of corruption, with uh, shortcomings in food provision, with strikes even. And these strikes and uh, uh, this uh, shortcoming in food provision may have something to do, it's symptomatic for a time when you could imagine that people were leaving Egypt and say, goodbye, Masalama, we want to leave this place. We are not looked after anymore in the proper way. Anyway, these forum houses are very typical for the uh, early Iron Age and continues even throughout uh, the history of the even the United Kingdom till, uh, uh, till the exile period. Uh, well, coming back to this forum house, uh, I would like to find an explanation. I mean, the, those who constructed it uh, surely were not Egyptians. Uh, and uh, it was interesting that Nadaf Naman in a recent paper has proposed that uh, uh, the bondage of uh, Israel 
did not happen in Egypt, but it happened in Canaan, which was uh, um, administered by the Egyptians and exploited by the Egyptians, and that uh, only in the retrospective uh, this uh, experience was transferred uh, uh, to Egypt, uh, where many uh, people from Canaan were even deported, and uh, the proof of deportation is here. However, I think these people uh, who constructed uh, this forum house, uh, uh, most likely in the time of, uh, of Ramses IV, were prisoners of war, uh, <clears throat> which were captured by Ramses III, who made a, uh, a raid to the desert of, of Zaire, and uh, he made a lot of prisoners of war there, which were usually distributed all over the country. And uh, among them also a group which was responsible for the construction of this house. But prisoners of war, being in bondage, okay, but uh, in Thebes, pulling down the temple of Aya and Horemheb for a new construction, this is not the message delivered to us in the Bible. Uh, the message is a different one, which is more in keeping with another story. Uh, this is Papyrus Anastasi IV, which mentions, uh, among many other things, one of the uh, uh, messages, stories, uh, is this kind of copy of a, of a uh, fortress, boundary fortress at the Eastern Delta, uh, in Jeku, uh, informing us of a group of Shosu Bedouins from Edom, which were allowed to enter uh, the tract of Jeku and were allowed to proceed till the pools, or we may translate even lakes of Pitom, uh, in order to keep their flocks alive and in order to keep themselves alive. Uh, this is much more in keeping with uh, the biblical uh, uh, tradition. Uh, and what is interesting is um, uh, that uh, here we have the Wadi Tumilat, and uh, probably the Frontier Fortress, the Chetemu, uh, with the name uh, of Merimptach, Hetep uh, Hermat. Uh, uh, was situated somewhere near the came where the bitter, the small Timsach Lake. Not so small, this lake, by the way. And uh, they were pro allowed to proceed till the pools of Piton. Well, the tract, which is w full of water and was even a huge overflow lake in the third millennium, perhaps even partly in the second millennium, is the western part of uh, the Wadi Tumila, just west of Tel Erotaba. Uh, because uh, here we find a basin, uh, an overflow lake uh, fed by a Nile channel. Similar situation as the uh, Fayum. As in the Fayum, not as big as in the Fayum, but quite a sizable, uh, quite a sizable lake, which contributed, by the way, to the name of this region in the Old Kingdom is uh, the eastern Hapun Nome. Uh, therefore, the lake is, uh, and perhaps in the time uh, of uh, around uh, <coughs> uh, 1200 BC, the, the papyrus dates into the reign of uh, Seti II, shortly before 1200 BC. Uh, this is, uh, uh, perhaps it was divided into several smaller lakes, because at that time the Pelusiac branch was not in full action anymore, and this means that also less water uh, was available for feeding this part of the Wadi Tumilat. But uh, the pools or the lakes of Pitom shows us that Pitom is not situated in the eastern part of the Wadi, but rather in the west or in the middle part. And the most prominent part which is called today Ras el Wadi, is just uh, uh, east of this overflow lake. It's Tel which is the most likely candidate 
for Pitom and not Tel el Maschuta. Tel el Maschuta is a much later affair, uh, not before the uh, Persian period or a later Saitic period. Uh, therefore, Maschuta cannot be uh, Pitom. And uh, Pitom, in this case, is not uh, just a region. Pitom is uh, a toponym. And uh, Tel Maschuta has a huge, uh, Tel El Rotaba has a huge fortress uh, recently excavated uh, by a Polish Slovak mission under uh, Rzepka and uh, Hudec, uh, who kindly uh, gave me those slides. It's the enclosure wall of the fortress, an inner enclosure wall, a temple, and uh, installations also of the 18th dynasty and uh, of the second intermediate period. Uh, with an enormous gate here, uh, similar in construction as uh, the gate of Medinet Habu, with enormous walls from the Remesite period. So this was a, a Remesite stronghold, without doubt, uh, a center of Remesite administration of this body. Uh, <clears throat> coming back to this uh, Papyrus Anastasi 6, Shosu Bedouins from Edom. One shouldn't translate it as Edomite <laughs> Bedouins. Shosu from Be Edom. Uh, the question is are they in the gene pool of the proto Israelites? I would say it is not out, it, it's not, uh, it is possible, although it is not cogent. But they were there <laughs> in the right time and uh, from the right region. Uh, Yahweh came from Edom. And uh, I would say at least uh, it's not a proof, but it is a very good illustration how we could imagine that uh, such population groups filtered into the delta with the blessing of the Egyptians, uh, by the way. Okay, thus far we only have uh, illustrative general, uh, general studies. The Forum House in Western Thebes, is it from Proto-Israelites? I would say we cannot say it is from proto-Israelites. I would make the definition different. I would say at least from a population which is very closely related, probably Shosu from the desert of Seir. And uh, at that time, the ethnogenesis has not been terminated. Uh, so they were in the pool of populations which later uh, became the Proto-Israelites. But more distinctive is, of course, this famous uh, stela, Israel stela of Merim Ptah from his fifth year, which deals mainly with a, uh, with a campaign in Libya, but mentions also uh, something like a campaign in uh, Canaan, uh, from Canaan to Ashkelon to Gezer to Yenoam, and finally, these are toponyms which are mentioned consecutively with, uh, finally, uh, after Yenuam, we have uh, men the mentioning of uh, Israel. Uh, Israel uh, as people, with a uh, classifier of people, a man and a woman, and the plural strokes here, uh, which means uh, this is not a tom toponym. These were people living. Uh, some were beyond Yenuam, either in the north or still in the Transjordan uh, at that time. We are here towards the end of the uh, 13th century, shortly before the 12th century, when we have the time of the settlement. Anyway, uh, I uh, put together some thoughts about uh, 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 Exodus theories in the past, uh, we know that now that uh, Piramesse uh, should be identified with the bibl biblical town of Ramses, uh, although Donald Redford is absolutely against it, and there are also other colleagues which are against it because uh, Ramses, the biblical town of Ramses, does not uh, have uh, 
pair, the estate uh, of Ramses in front of it, but it was already Ellen Gardiner who showed uh, that uh, um, uh, Piramese was, was sometimes written in a different way, uh, especially if uh, uh, um, it had a different, uh, if, for instance, if an, an, an estate or a, um, a different meaning was uh, uh, intended, uh, uh, it is perfectly possible to write, to accept also Ramses alone without the pair uh, as the biblical town of uh, Ramses. Uh, uh, and it was the most prominent uh, Ramesite, uh, the most prominent Ramesite uh, uh, construction in the Delta. Uh, but uh, besides that, uh, the Bible speaks of uh, indirectly of a residence uh, in the Eastern Delta. Moses and Aaron had to, had to appear in the same evening when uh, a plague happened at the residence of the king. Uh, this is not possible if the king resided in Memphis or even in Upper Egypt. So uh, we have to assume that Ramses meant a, a residence, and this can only be Piramese, the most important town of Ramses, um, the second and his followers. Uh, besides that, we have, of course, also the town of Pitom, which uh, is, uh, uh, according to my opinion, to be identified uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Telerotaba, an opinion which already uh, was uh, uh, presented by Ellen Gardiner and many others. Uh, Jean Leclan uh, wrote uh, an important entry in a lexicon. It was only uh, recently that uh, Donald Redford, uh, uh, for one reason or the other, uh, meant that uh, it is Tel Maschuta, uh, but Maschuta for chronological reason is out of question. Now, uh, we have the position of uh, Piramese here. We know that uh, Piramese uh, was active until late in the 20th dynasty. Afterwards, the Pelusiac branch of the Nile was blocked up by sedimentation. Uh, an enormous change has happened in the geography of the Eastern Delta. The Nile branch, the, which we may call for convenience sake the Pelusiac branch of the Nile, was active till the late 20th dynasty. Afterwards, we have no occupation, no settlements along its banks, at least in its lower reaches, except uh, uh, up to Bubastis. But everything else starts again only in the late Saitic period again, including Teletaba. There is a gap which means that the Pelusiac branch was not an active Nile branch, therefore uh, it had not no harbor function anymore, and uh, uh, the residents had to move to Tanis with the 21st dynasty. This is an enormous change, and therefore uh, Piramese was used as a quarry to furnish a new Libyan residences at Tanis and in Bubastis. We found numerous stones. If you go to Tanis, you find an abundance of Remesite uh, uh, stones with reliefs and uh, also colossal statues there. And also in Bubastis, you find uh, remains of uh, uh, blocks which were quarried in Piramese and shipped via a channel from the Pelusiac to the Tutanis or uh, till Bubastis. It seems that the blockage of the Pelusiac was uh, in its lower reaches only. But this had an effect also on the boundary waters of Egypt, which were not fed anymore with waters. But it had also an effect uh, in the whole uh, geography uh, of the Eastern Delta. And I mention this specifically because now uh, there is uh, the opinion uh, that uh, the, biblical, uh, the, the, the biblical history of Genesis and Exodus reflects the geography of the Saitic period or even later. Uh, but uh, uh, maybe we can 
we are able to identify features, geographical features in the book of uh, Exodus, which go back to the Ramesside period. And indeed, it is, we can prove it uh, that uh, uh, in the, the Bible reflects uh, geographical conditions which only are valid for the Ramesside period, for the late Ramesside period. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, the so-called uh, way of the land of the Philistines, uh, which is always considered as an anachronism and um, also used uh, to uh, date Exodus much later, uh, is perfectly possible if you date the sojourn of uh, the proto-Israelites into Egypt uh, into the 20th dynasty, in the time of the 20th dynasty, in the same time when you have uh, the spread of Iron Age settlements in uh, the hill countries in northern Galilee and in, in the Negev. Uh, this is precisely the time when uh, Israelites could also have come to Egypt, at least some of them, either as prisoners of war or as peaceful immigrants. Uh, Yes, I know I am not yet done with. When Piramese was quarried in order to furnish a new sites, Bubastis and Tanis, also blocks with cult figures of the gods of Ramses of Piramese uh, were transported to Tanis and were transported to Bubastis and perhaps also to other towns nearby, perhaps even to Belu Pelusium what is later Pelusium. Anyway, in the fourth, mil fourth century BC, in the Persian period, suddenly we have evidence of cults for the gods of Ramses of Pyramese in Tanis. And we have also evidence of cults of, for the gods of Ramses of Pyramese in Bubastis at the same time. There were even priests, high priests, uh, uh, busy, in this period. So this see, it seems that uh, in Tanis, they thought at that time in the fourth century that this was originally Piramese because of, of the abundance of stones and cult uh, reliefs uh, and uh, uh, mon monumental statues uh, from, this, from the Ramesside period. The same was thought in Bubastis, not uh, that they thought uh, in Bubastis was Piramese, but perhaps one of the tells in the Wadi Tumilat, perhaps Tel El Kebir, perhaps uh, Tel El Rotaba. Anyway, we have uh, here in the north and in the south cults for the gods of Ramses and Piramese. And uh, we could imagine that exilic Jews settling in uh, the Eastern Delta, among them was even the prophet Jeremiah who stayed in uh, Defene. Uh, were interested to find vestiges of the forefathers in the delta. And they were, of course, uh, depending on the opinion of the Egyptians, uh, on, on the contemporary Egyptians. And this explains why, for instance, in the Psalm 78, Tanis uh, was considered uh, or, or was associated with Piramese and the miracles which the Lord performed in the fields of Soan uh, aim at the Mansala Lake as uh, the Sea of Reeds. And the same is true uh, to some extent, uh, at least um, the uh, Septuaginta uh, scholars, uh, uh, they identified the Wadi Tumilat as the root of the Exodus uh, and perhaps the Timsach Lake as uh, uh, as uh, the Sea of Reeds. Uh, some glosses even thought of uh, Heliopolis uh, uh, as P. Atom, Per Atom, the house of Atom, or the estate of Atom, uh, as being uh, uh, Pitom, and uh, that the Exodus started from here uh, to the Red Sea. Uh, so different Exodus versions in the late Targum, Yerushalmi, uh, Pelusium is mentioned as, uh, as Piramese, 
uh, and or as, as Ramses, uh, and uh, they envisaged a kind of exodus route over uh, um, along uh, the Serbonis Lake at the northern edge of the Serbonis Lake. Uh, all these exodus uh, interpretations can be explained by the dissemination of stones. I've written this already in 1975, but uh, it's written in German, therefore few take advantage of this uh, uh, publication in uh, the volume Teletava II. Anyway, uh, Pyramese Ramses was here, and uh, if one could create a kind of scenery, imaginary, for the Exodus route, the only way people could leave this place was between the Pelusiac branch and the Bacher el Baga drainage system. You cannot cross the Bacher el Baga. Therefore, a reconstruction going from Tanis to Pitom and then uh, continue to the Wadi Tumila is not very likely. Uh, I think that two Exodus versions merged here uh, in uh, the book uh, Exodus 1320. It seems that Sukkot, which is Jeku, was the place from where the Proto-Israelites started the Exodus, whereas uh, Ramses was uh, clearly uh, referred to as a starting point uh, in another passage and also in the book uh, Numeri of Numbers. Uh, but in this case, you have to move northwards and then you come into a situation where you either have to pass the frontier fortresses officially or if you cannot do it, you have to pass uh, the Balach Lakes, which were at that time probably a body of water, uh, at least in the time of the 19th, 20th dynasty, still fed by off shots of the Pelusiac branch of the Nile. And there were forts you can pass, and surely Bedouins or migrants knew these passages. They entered Egypt in this way illegally, and they left Egypt illegally in this way. And uh, at least I wouldn't say w this is a proof, we have a proof of Exodus, but it is at least a scenario. And uh, uh, taking also the toponyms together, the Balach lakes, which are of course uh, uh, to be identified with uh, pa with pa Chufi, uh, the papyrus uh, uh, marshes, uh, uh, mentioned uh, in Papyrus Anastasi III and in the Onomasticon Aminope uh, to be dated uh, the former into the late 19th dynasty, the latter at the end of the 20th uh, dynasty or even already in the, in the 21st dynasty, uh, which shows that uh, entities of Egyptian geography in the Eastern Delta filtered into the book of Exodus uh, and already partly into Genesis. Uh, the land of Ramses is used, for instance, uh, synonymously with the land of Goshen. Uh, yeah, uh, anyway, what I wanted to show is that features of the geography in the time of uh, the 19th, 20th dynasty filtered into the, uh, into the tradition of the book of Exodus. And uh, uh, this is a very interesting uh, uh, conclusion. And uh, therefore, we cannot uh, date the whole composition of the Exodus into the Saitic period or even later. Some parts must have been conceived much earlier. Well, this is. Uh, the region I'm talking about. Here is uh, Avaris Pyramese, uh, Rams, the town of Ramses, and the way one has to leave between the Bachar el Baga and the Pelusiac branch. These were swamps, perennial swamps, difficult to cross, so you have to leave from here. And before you come to these frontier fortresses, you can you can uh, cross this uh,
stretch of water, which I think is Pachufi, which is mentioned together with the Shihoa. Also, uh, the Shihoa is known in the Old Testament in quite a lot of passages. It's a frontier water of Egypt, but also known Pachufi and uh, Shihoa are mentioned together in Papyrus Anastas, the three as providers of reeds and rushes for uh, Piramesse in a biology of Piramesse. So therefore, there are also components of the geography of the uh, Ramesside period, because later, uh, when the Pelusiac branch dried up, they were not watered anymore from this source. They did not dry up, but they became much more uh, reduced in their capacity. Well, uh, what remains is Piramesse, the splendid residence of the 19th and 20th dynasty, and what remains behind, some fragments of enormous statues, the tiles of Seti I from his palace in Gantia. Here is a palace of uh, Seti I according to a reconstruction map of my colleague Josef Dorner, who also found those canals. And uh, uh, along one of those canals, you have uh, uh, Edgar Pusch, who gave me the permission to show this to you. Uh, he found a stable of half a thousand horses of the Ramesside period with tethering stones. Each horse had its own WC in order to keep their hoofs dry and uh, avoid uh, hoof uh, diseases. Uh, Edgar Push, yes. yes. Push was able to find, uh, I mean, to reconstruct uh, by geomagnetic surveying uh, big parts of Piramesse and uh, showing us that here a temple, by the way, that this was a huge, splendid city, but he also found remains of uh, um, military workshops, uh, and we excavated uh, cemeteries to the south of Piramese, big cemeteries uh, for the normal population. And uh, well, finally, all this splendor went to Tanis and Bubastis, and uh, uh, I would like to end uh, my lecture and uh, I hope to give you a glimpse in what archaeology is able uh, to perform. Thank you very much.